Okei, okay, hyvää iltaa Merikerhon terassi. Tervetuloa PhDJs klubin iltaan numero kaksi. Ää, viime kuukausi, kuukausi sitten alkoi tämä meidän PhDJs klubi ja se tuo musiikin tutkimusta Merikerhon terassille. Eli seiskana kanana aloitellaan tunnin kestävällä haastattelulla, jossa haastatellaan musiikin tutkijaa hänen tutkimusaiheestaan ja sitten kasista eteenpäin DJ Musaa täällä. Ja Iltaa vetää Mikko Matlar, minä ja Kim Ramstedt, joka ei tänään päässyt paikalle, mutta yhdelläkin haastattelijalla tämä homma hoitunee ja hoituu senkin takia, että meidän vieras sattuu olemaan myöskin DJ tänään, eli me soitetaan sitten vieraamme kanssa kahdestaan levyt täällä kasin jälkeen. Vieraana tänään on Edon Blakai Aalto-yliopiston kauppakorkeakoulusta ja jutellaan DJ-kulttuurista, jota Edon tutkii. Ja Thanks. Ja öö, me jutellaan siitä englanniksi, koska Hedon ei ole suomalainen, mutta toivottavasti ymmärrätte, mitä me puhutaan. Hedon on tullut Suomeen tutkimaan suomalaisia dj ja se on se kiinnostava asetelma, että kyselen siitä tässä ja jutellaan siitä tässä noin 45 minuuttia. Tervetuloa siis tänne ja nyt alkaa keskusteluosuus musaa sitten kasin jälkeen. Öö, Welcome to Mary Kero, Hedon Blakai and PSDJs. Thank you so much, Hank. Thank you for having me. Uh, great that you could make it, and uh, you're researching DJ culture. Tell us about your like precise topic. Well, I'll just start maybe detouring a little bit. Uh, I'm interested... Yeah, um, my interests uh, in general are in consumer culture, and specifically I'm, I'm quite interested in, in aestheticization of various Uh, practices or consumption practices. So, uh, one field that I think I could explore uh, these ideas is through uh, studying uh, club cultures and DJs. We want more. <laughs> um, I can continue. <laughs> yeah, I just put on more, more volume. I'm not bored with your <laughs> presentation yet. Uh, Like DJ culture and consumerism, what are your like main interests in this topic? So uh, another another facet that uh, we explore, for example, uh, uh, various uh, cultures or subcultures, depending on the terminology one likes to use, is that you know a lot of these uh, relationships or social relationships are mediated through the market. And that aspect is very very uh, interesting to me in general. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, these DJs uh, have to buy vinyl, they have to buy clothes, they have to develop a particular persona, if you will. Um, they have to, uh, they congregate in certain, in certain spaces and places, and these are all kind of uh, come from the market. And not to mention the discourses that these people draw, draw from to kind of uh, maintain this, this, this uh, culture altogether. So in general, discourses, objects, things, ideas, that is what is uh, in interesting to me and how they add up to this uh, aestheticization of, of various uh, consumer practices. How do they deal with this? Like, if you say you're like uh, research researching their job as like a part of consumerism, they are consuming things and they're like part of the business. Does it sound bad to them? Well, one thing for sure is that, you know, they cannot escape the market just like that. Uh, they're all like these countervailing practices that these guys tend to uh, engage in, right? Or the narratives or stories they develop that are supposedly uh, somehow uh, pushed against these mainstream mar market ideas. But still, uh, when we speak about the market, we do not mean necessarily in, in a negative sense that some people like to speak about, but we live in this particular system that is called capitalist system and all, almost all our relationships are somehow uh, uh, belong, are part of the system. Uh, what I wanted to add uh, to, to this idea is and one reason why I'm interested in, in DJs is because I, I was also very interested in this notion of cultural producers as a, as a concept and the notion of, 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 the, of, the, of the time that we live in, especially when we speak about 
the so-called uh, aesthetic expressive contexts like arts and music and so forth and so forth. So there is a, the, in literature, of course, you will find different terms and terminology that tend to speak about the time that we live in, like postmodern or post uh, you, you name it. But a key aspect to this, uh, to this um, uh, era or epoch, I don't like these terms, by the way, that much, uh, are these so-called cultural producers, this idea that, you know, we do not, we are interested in, 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 in the knowledge we have about, about stuff, and that's what makes these people very interesting. And having said that, uh, the, a lot of literature that pertains to this uh, cultural production domain in cultural studies, broadly speaking, tends to portray uh, a rather kind of heroic picture about these cultural producers. So my, my, my uh, how would I say, my approach is maybe to problematize this concept a little bit and try to learn a little bit more about uh, the cultural production as a process and perhaps maybe tell something more about the, the times that we live in. Uh, you mentioned these times that we are living and I, what I, when I think about this uh, DJs and cultural production nowadays, I, I think it's been only here in this form for, for like a couple of decades or something. Or if you read, read books from the 70s about cultural production, is there like anything useful for you? Uh, yeah, I think it's very, very interesting to read this kind of historically or genealogically this this notion, especially when if we start from somewhere, we could start with with the uh, work of Pierre Bourdieu and the the Distinction book in 1984 when he introduces the term cultural producer and cultural production and uh, and move uh, uh, onward. So they, there there is an idea that you know we have we are now living in a particular time and these people somehow are important to understand uh, to understand what they do and how they do stuff so we can understand the, the system that we live in. Uh, of course, uh, later on if we move uh, forward, uh, another interesting book that I think kind of tries to bring forth this notion is Featherstone's book from 1991 where he says that actually, you know, we live in these so-called postmodern modern times and actually if we want to understand postmodern dynamics and the experiences that people have with postmodern postmodernism in general we really need to pay attention to to these so-called cultural producers not only understanding understanding them but understanding the processes this is the emphasis is on processes and how they do and what they do stuff right so this is something that I'm very interested in at the end of the day uh, this has generated a lot of discussion then in cultural studies in general where people take these calls and try to uh, kind of problematize or try to differentiate different facets of cultural production. All of a sudden now we have not only advertisers, because advertisers are the probably the biggest fraction of people that are studied, but we have also a city tour guys dubbed as cultural entrepreneurs or cultural producers, uh, brand managers. Uh, DJs now, there are like few attempts to speak about DJs. So there, there are these calls that call for process, but also for, for kind of differentiation between these, these, uh, these uh, different facets of cultural producers. And I think this differentiation to me is not very interesting to me. What is more interesting is understanding the, the process itself, the pro productive aspect of this, of, of this, uh, of this uh, concept, especially in the context that I study it. Uh, you gave me a ride when we came here. Thanks for that. <laughs> now here in public, and uh, uh, when we drove here, you said that DJs are like unique. The, uh, the occup occupation or the role of DJ is, is really unique. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, when I said unique, I, I mean unique in a, in in a, in a, in, a, in terms of how literature speaks about cultural production, right? So you have these. Uh, delineations of various uh, aspects of, of cultural producers. There are usually people that actually make stuff like architects or uh, designers and so forth and so forth. Then there are cultural intermediaries, another facet within cultural production. Then there are like consumers of, 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 uh, of, of uh, the, 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 what these two groups have produced. 
So with, with DJs, you'll see all these, for example, uh, these uh, categories blurring, right? So DJs make music, they try to promote music, they have to press music in vinyl, also make files. At the same time, they have to organize events, right? And communicate these events to a certain crowd or audience of people. So they are like con constantly like crossing across different categories that, broadly speaking, this uh, cultural production uh, literature would speak about. So in a sense, that's something that I, I think is, is very interesting about DJs in general. It's multitasking or what it is like doing different things like all together. Um, but it was like that already in the early decades of DJs or more, mostly they had to just speak and play records, but that's already two things. I guess, for example, if we go back to early 80s New York, where DJs started to become prominent figures, right? So if we think of Paradise Garage in New York City, this is probably, it is argued that this is the time where the DJ appears as a, as a figure, as a persona in front of the, uh, in front of the audience. So they, they I think, uh, the culture itself was not as dynamic as I would think of it today. I could be wrong, though. Uh, I think there is way more, way much more pressure on today's DJs to, to, to kind of do certain stuff in a certain way in order to be uh, in the know, to use uh, um, the words, what is the local pop culture? Thornton, Thornton's uh, vernacular. when there have been articles about history of live music, at least in Finland, the like, common opinion is that the musicians are sing and singers are much more professional nowadays than they used to be because you can't be drunk anymore when you're performing and, and things like that. You have to be fit in order to give a good performance as the same thing happened with DJs. Well, I, in, in my... Uh, of course, I have been DJing myself for almost 15 years, but I have been seriously, like ethnographically exploring and trying to understand DJ club culture for uh, over two years now. So I see like, I think it, it depends, uh, it depends where these people play, uh, in what venue they play and who plays, you know. There are some DJs that kind of seem to be better off when they are like a little bit tipsy or something like that, but some, so I've observed some DJs, they come in a very, spe with a very specific, specific ritual in, in mind when they perform. For example, if we take Kaiko here across the street, I've noticed that some people come like really also mentally prepared, you know, they put these stripes on like Arate Kid ideas and they embark in this ritual, so it's almost very spiritual for them. And I have, because I wanted to understand these aspects very well, I have also hosted a lot of DJs. Uh, a number of them have refused to drink alcohol, for example, because they wanted to really deliver. So it, maybe you can draw a parallel with the live musicians in, 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 that, in that, with some live musicians. I'm not an expert on that field. Well, we'll see uh, this modern DJing later tonight, but uh, there are all these uh, fancy words from like books about music and history and culture in the 70s like gatekeepers and, and such and also of course artists that's a really old concept uh, can you use these kind of concepts as, at all when you're like researching the modern DJ? Yeah, well, I, I guess metaphorically maybe we can use them but I would think that maybe uh, I would uh, the way I see this gatekeeping is uh, somehow as an effect rather than something that is inherent in a DJ, you know, because I think there is a concept. DJs like to speak about concepts these days. For example, okay, this is the concept and this is how we will do stuff, this is the music we will play, this is the, what the venue will look like and so forth and so forth. So this whole discourse in itself creates a particular type of a gatekeeping, if you will, you know, and dictates to an extent who gets to play and who doesn't get to play. So it's a classificatory mechanism in, in, in a sense. So to me, it's not that the gatekeeper himself or herself decides just like that, that, okay, I want this person to play here or not. It's more of what is like up, up in the air. Yeah, and if you have a concept of certain music, then you, of course, you have to 
leave something out or you want to leave something out and then it's also gatekeeping isn't it yeah i guess we can use metaphorically again this this gatekeeping yes uh, to me from my perspective uh, yeah 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 of course you know uh, there are for example uh, people that i have uh, talked to that are uh, djs that have been djing for, for for many years some of them do not get a chance anymore to play in some of the venues that i have uh, uh, explored and it's uh, partially due to this key keeping practices if you, if you will. What about artists? It's an interesting concept and one of Bourdieu's key concepts or like when I finished my dissertation it, all this legitimization was about somebody being an artist and somebody not being an artist and people like claiming yes or no about somebody's artist status uh, what about these DJs that you have interviewed do they consider them as artists or do they like strictly consider them as not artists well uh, th uh, okay. I, this is a very interesting question I'm not sure that I have a straight answer to this because none of these guys that I have talked to actually use the word artist that much uh, but maybe this was a kind of it was an understood thing, you know, it was by default. Uh, but I guess at the end of the day, uh, when you see actually how people speak about these pigs, they, uh, about DJs, they speak to, uh, about them as being artists. And now uh, we can perhaps maybe conceptually uh, dig into this, again, not my expertise on, 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 this, on this matter, but uh, my understanding was that, you know, this is like, didn't seem very uh, a primary thing for them whether they are called artists or not. To them, was uh, seemed what seemed more interesting is to live this particular culture in a in a particular authentic way that they they deem to be authentic. What about their audience? Uh, do you have any like opinion or what do you think? Do they consider the star DJs that they are artists and they can play anything? as artists or act like artists or whatever? Okay, this, this, this is a very interesting question to me because I'm not interested in, in audience uh, reception, if you, uh, a reception of the, of the DJ and DJ uh, performance, but more so in what DJs do and how they do stuff. But this is something that I observe uh, rather often is that oftentimes, you know, that if you observe the DJ booths, you see a lot of DJs hanging around. So a lot of... Uh, performance aspects is not necessarily of course it is but not strong uh, strictly uh, oriented towards the audience it's more about uh, as some as one of my um, uh, friends likes to call out nerding the nerds right so you show to other DJs uh, music that you play that is not is not mainstream it's hard to find and so forth and so forth you know okay we could move on from art history to economics uh, you're doing your research in the school of economics so is the club culture in helsinki also a business well it is it is a business of course it's a particular type of business um, i have tendencies sometimes to call it almost kind of a social uh, uh, kind of a moralizing business when you speak to the owners of these uh, clubs you know you often observe that the the, the financial aspect uh, of, of running these uh, the, uh, these clubs is uh, is secondary, and this is like a, uh, evident when they speak about the investments they make in the club, for example, in the sound system. One of my uh, one of my friends again that I that I interviewed and I had uh, prolonged discussions with him he speaks about the sound system as, as as being a mortgage. You know, usually you get a mortgage to buy a, to buy a house, not a not a not invest in a, in, a, in, a, in a business. So, uh, and of course, uh, if you kind of, uh, uh, kind of dig deeper into the, this guy's particular discourse, you see the investment this person has in this culture in general. I had one thing to say about this artist uh, stuff. Uh, there is one older DJ in Helsinki who uses his his DJ name is DJ Artist and then his real name. So <laughs> there is at least one DJ who uses this. He's like in his 60s, I guess. He started in late 70s and 
is still playing. But maybe you should inter interview him about how this. Uh, of course, you know you 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 uh, are probably better versed in these historical ideas how certain terms and concepts kick in in a particular culture like DJ culture. But to me, at least, you know, these, for example, this notion of artist perhaps was way uh, way more important, like let's say 10 years ago than it is now. So somehow this term or concept has disappeared out of the concept of these people. Of course, they, they speak about, oh, we have this artist here, but it doesn't go any further than that. It basically means that we have a DJ. And people, according to what I understood from these guys that I, I, I speak to and I uh, interview, People are interested in consuming not only the DJ, but the whole experience that is part of that, to what these guys are offering. Uh, club culture is kind of business. It has to be a business also, because there's no public funding in club cultures, as far as I know. Uh, do you have any opinion, will there once be a time that we have public funding in running the clubs? Or do the club owners even want to have public funding in them? Okay, this is probably something uh, interesting, and I, again, I'm, uh, I'm not an expert in this aspect, but I could probably share an opinion about it. But if you see what these guys do and how they do stuff, they would try to kind of, uh, especially with clubs, not with festivals, because they, with festivals they do seek governmental funding as much as possible, uh, probably because investments are way bigger than in clubs, but with clubs, they, 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 the whole story is that this somehow is, this is like kind of a, an underground thing, it's, it's not mainstream, we have our own thing here, so we are in the periphery doing our own thing, this is like legit, this is authentic, and so forth and so forth. And if you consider, for, for example, with, uh, with Helsinki, the underground scene is not very competitive when it comes to clubs, so maybe some of these guys are kind of and in, in uh, how would I say, kind of in a, in a position not to seek a certain uh, funds from elsewhere. We can move on to the underground topic because we have a very good case from what just happened today. Uh, Well-known DJ Jeremy Underground was supposed to perform in Edinburgh, I guess, and uh, uh, well, do you want to explain what happened because it was quite an easy, interesting and long story, but he, it seems that he's not that underground as he could be. Well, apparently this is like what I skimmed through because people are so busy in writing comments I would not catch up, but uh, one of, uh, there's a French guy called Jeremy Underground and he is, uh, somehow he was valued uh, among the underground uh, club culture, like, broadly speaking, like, globally speaking, uh, for his efforts to uh, kind of revive this so-called the Jersey sound, that is a house music sound that was very popular in the in early 90s. And uh, he, he uh, repressed some of the old records and made some compilations and he gained a particular status with that. So he was in Helsinki here like uh, five, five, year, five years ago and uh, he goes by the name Jeremy Underground, meaning that is like underground music. And, and now I, I refer to the, to the uh, uh, what I did in my ethnography, for example, is that when I uh, hosted a lot of people, no, all, no one has ever uh, asked any detail regarding accommodation. So this guy was supposed to play in, in Edinburgh and uh, through his manager or agent, he was demanding that he sleeps in a five-star hotel. And uh, so there was a lot of stuff going on and these guys were really trying to accommodate this person and so they they, uh, they were trying to actually book this guy to a five-star uh, hotel for three nights which was something like 700 pounds a night but eventually you know the quarrel between the promoters back in edinburgh and the the, the agent like reached a tipping point where these guys said you know what that's it we're gonna stop this so and the agent basically started like uh, threatening them through uh, social media uh, platforms and personal messaging and so forth. So these guys decided to post these, uh, this, this discussion uh, on, on their Facebook uh, wall. And now it's viral. And uh, so then you see like, uh, you see 
what is very interesting about because I have not read all through all these threads, but you see how much these people are invested in this particular culture, uh, and at what stake some of these commenters, right, are willing to go to, to defend certain aspects of this of this culture and to keep it uh, underground, if you will. So, uh, but there are aspects. So. In a sense, what we can one aspect that we can learn is that this particular club culture is structured in a particular way. So if you deviate, if you will, from norms, say, you will be kind of punished. Yeah, and I, I also thought about these concepts of mainstream and underground. But if um, it's so important, what kind of DJ uses underground as part of his DJ name? Then it seems that underground matters still. Yeah, I think this this underground aspect versus mainstream has been researched quite a lot in uh, relative to club cultures, and I think uh, uh, the uh, the book that we just referred to is like uh, where uh, dedicates a whole chapter on this uh, mainstream versus versus underground. But I, I I guess you know you can we can interpret this uh, underground aspect in many ways, and I think it's not a, a clear cut concept or a term that we can refer to. There are people that um, speak about underground as in terms of this is underground music in musical terms, but there are also people that speak uh, speak about underground as against the mainstream or against the corporatist world that we live in. So uh, I guess you can break down this term in, 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 in these two aspects or even, even more. Yeah, I had a question here that how can you define underground, but that's maybe too difficult. It's, it's quite a concept, but it's it's been running for decades and it's still going strong. This is this is something very interesting about club cultures in general because people tend to refer to genres and terms and ideas that they have about what they do and how they do. But if you ask them to define what it means, is that almost no one will be able to give you a clear cut, cut definition. And if you go to YouTube, for example, there's an, an old video where DJ Harvey is asked to define the notion of Balearic. It stops because it's very difficult. It's, it's lived, it's embodied, you know. It's, it's something that you feel it and then you know it. So it, then words become very difficult to explain. Uh, you have interviewed many Helsinki area DJs for your dissertation. Uh, how many, actually? I have interviewed 13, but I have a lot, another 10 or 15 that I speak to and I take notes. Some of these guys are not willing, they are not keen in giving a traditional interview, but they are willing to, to speak about it. Um, so I have uh, been talking to them and uh, my interviews have been lasting for an hour and a half to three hours. Uh, but to me, the interviews are just a tick box in my uh, uh, method section, but uh, way more interesting is the follow-up discussions that I have like with these guys on a regular basis. Uh, how could how would you define DJs that are working in Helsinki area or these DJs that you have interviewed? Are there some things in common among them? Uh, I guess uh, well, so it, it, very interesting thing about DJs is, is one at least one facet that I find very interesting is the the area of music that they tend to specialize in. You know. There is this kind of a kind of a distinctive feather that these guys tend to develop. For example, someone is uh, tend music wise like he specialized, let's say, in in certain music, new wave, deep house, techno. So they, they take this, that as a competitive advantage when they go out to play music. And, um, and some people are also in, uh, very good in promoting and bringing new ideas and so forth and so forth. But what is also very interesting about the, the group of people that I, uh, that I uh, work with uh, is that uh, the, the collaborative aspect of, of, of organizing certain certain events. So, for example, if you would use Bourdieu's work, you would try to see to seek for tensions and 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 these positions within the field. But 
maybe that 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 is the case, but more often, you know, the, you see the collaborative, the work, the kind of the, the liaison aspects between these people, so, and trying to kind of maintain this what they have, this culture that they have here. Uh, very interesting aspect is as well is this the relationships that these guys have with other like-minded DJs uh, across Europe and the U.S. Now more more so in Europe than in the U.S. because a lot of New York DJs now live in Berlin because of various various reasons. So you see, when these these guys come from these various various uh, hubs or cities, like let's say uh, Berlin or or uh, Amsterdam, you know, you see like similarities in 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 uh, in what they do and how they do. I have not explored this this aspect, but at least based on, on literature and readings, you can see that you know this notion of culture, uh, uh, club cultures and music culture that I study is kind of uh, quite similar across these 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 cities. So then, a good research question would be the city and the music scene to study. Uh, you mentioned this, like how DJs are concentrating on certain genres or sounds and then trying to be very good at them. Can you consider that as branding? Certainly, yes. You know, uh, these people, there's, well, there are, now you see also within branding literature, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of interest on, on people brands, right? Not on brands, brands, but on people brands and, and, uh, and how they work on their bodies, and, and I think this is again very consistent with this postmodern li literature, if you will. You know, now we this also post for this that these cultural uh, intermediate literature likes to speak to speak about. So now we work on our bodies. You know, our bodies somehow have become canvases that we have to constantly work on. So we are stamped with various uh, branded with various ideas, not necessarily visible, but in this case with music. Like ah, uh, this guy is an expert in, let's say, in in, in deep house or synth pop or or techno and so forth and so forth. But another interesting aspect is that they, these guys do not tend to stay static in these genres. Some of them do, but the ones that do, they tend to be dis discarded. So there is the circulation of genres that tends to come up every three, four years. So you really need to know your disco, your Italo disco, your deep house. Uh, uh, and when we speak about house music, you really need to know also to be specialized in certain sounds, like with this Jeremy Underground that is not underground anymore, uh, uh, with Jersey sound and uh, New York sound and Chicago uh, house sound and, and so forth and so forth. Um, now you have an interview of these DJs operating in Helsinki, so I guess do you have some opinions about the DJ culture that is in this city? How good is it or how big is it, especially compared to other cities that are about the same size? So of course, I have not uh, visited many cities uh, and focused specifically on nitty-gritty details, but what I understand from the, when I speak to the DJs that come from these other cities about the club culture here, uh, it is uh, the opinion is that you know this the scene here, if you will, is no different than the scene that is in Amsterdam or in Berlin. Also, albeit Berlin is like way bigger in terms of places it, 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 it offers. But let's say as a as a, a in terms of sophistication, it's up there. It's in par with uh, all these places that. Uh, that you can find in Amsterdam or Frankfurt or Berlin, uh, and I don't know about Japan. And uh, another aspect is like the, 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 the resemblance of the clubs. You know, for example, if you go to Kaiko, and if, or if you go to uh, and if you go online and and just Google uh, they, they, this club uh, in Frankfurt called Live at Robert Johnson's, you'll see a resemblance in how they are like kind of uh, um, aesthetically uh, organized. When I read these old newspapers, old Finnish newspapers and the music artists, uh, articles, it's always been a problem that we have, like all these uh, Central European bigger cities are way ahead of uh, us and then it's like a shame that the Finns are always behind these big cities, but I guess now these people would be happy at least about the 
status of, of the state of black cultures. To add this, you know, because now, for example, uh, Kaiku as a venue has a, has a received a lot of promotion, if you will, or vibe from uh, 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 different uh, DJ related magazines or platforms like Resident Advisor did a big, big piece on, on Kaiku and then Boiler Room organized an event in Kaiku and I asked one of the owners, what do you think about this? No, no, this is already too much marketing for us. So they want to stay underground. <laughs> Keep the underground. Uh, is, we are soon finishing. Is there something you want to tell us about your uh, dissertation? You're actually quite near to finish, I heard. Yeah, I'm trying to wrap, wrap it up now, but I'm kind of stuck with another project a little bit for at least for another month. But now uh, I, I've kind of decided that I, I I will stop doing ethnography and I, I've, I've been writing on it so I really uh, should finish this project as fast as possible uh, I've kind of reorganized my data so it kind of looks good I think I have most of my boxes are ticked now so just need, needs to at least the, the, the latter part of my dissertation needs to be written and maybe send off for some pre-examination. Uh, how about the amount of research made about DJ culture? Like, it's a couple of decades now, and did you find enough sources for your dissertation, or did you have trouble with that? Well, there are not many uh, papers that I have come across that use DJs as, as, as a context to study something or uh, or anything else, but uh, I have found some, but they are not necessarily concentrated in one 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 outlet outlet per, per se. Uh, so it's kind of scattered all over the place. But I noticed that you know recently there is a tendency to use DJs and speak about cultural production quite a bit, or they tend to use another term, cultural and, and entrepreneurship, and to see how, for example, this um, this uh, this type of work fits in in today's, uh, in today's uh, uh, kind of market and system where a lot of jobs are disappearing and so forth and so forth. So that's that's something that I find very very interesting. But yeah, different outlets, different journals, different twists in how they study DJs. Not easy to find. Yeah, I can, I can agree with that. But uh, you mentioned these occupations that are like disappearing and all this talk that within a couple of decades we don't have any occupation or any, maybe some occupations but but many of those that we have now uh, what will happen to the DJ? Well, you know, I'm not an expert in occupation but what I can gather what I can gather out of this literature is that, that focuses on um, on, uh, on on work on, on this, on the nature of work in the so-called, what they call this post fordist era, where, you know, a lot of um, um, industries are turning into so, these so-called knowledge industries. They, there is a kind of a very, how would I say, uh, an optimistic view about these professions. You know, this is the way to go, uh, according to this particular line of literature that says, okay, this is, the creativity is something that will sell. And, uh, the, the, you see that there, there's a lot of, uh, how would I say, call for, for various governments, especially in the West, to invest in these kind of spheres. Because that's where the economy is heading to, this, this knowledge-based economy, this specialization of various uh, occupations and so forth and so forth. And then you see another, another strand to it is that you really need companies, uh, main, even mainstream companies, they should somehow absorb uh, these people within, within and, uh, and utilize them, but I think this is this is nothing new. If you look at the cooptation theory, for example, you see that the mainstream has always like kind of uh, uh, how would I say the mainstream has always kind of fed on the outskirts, on the periphery. The periphery has always been the blood uh, source for the for the mainstream. So I think this this tension is very very interesting uh, from this uh, kind of work. Based perspective, but then again, I'm not an expert on the nature of work. 
but it's okay also just to say your opinions for them without just just your opinions. Educated guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, I have one more question here, and then I guess then we'll move behind the DJ booth and start playing. Uh, what makes a good DJ from your point of view? Uh, well, I guess uh, this is very interesting again, uh, this, this topic, what makes it a good DJ. For example, uh, uh, the, the, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Tech Mantel Festival. Uh, these Deck Mantel guys are now very big on the idea of organizing festivals. It's like flow festival on steroids. And uh, so what makes it a good DJ? There was a very interesting case there. There was a, a Canadian DJ playing music and I, uh, of course, they cooperated with Boiler Room in this, in this instance and you could actually see how DJs play and what they play live. Uh, a fascinating aspect was that she, this lady DJ from Canada was playing music but she was not mixing. So you see like tons of comments now, huh? the division between, huh? on this specific notion, what is a good DJ? Is it, a, are you a good DJ if you can mix records, beat mix records, or a good DJ if you can, if you have good taste and you play very good records? So now again, this, there is no clear-cut answer to this, what makes it a good DJ, but everyone seems to have its own or her own preferences and tastes in what, what, is, uh, what is a good DJ. To me, a good DJ personally is the one that is also very invested, but someone also who knows, who has a concept in what he or she plays. That's a good answer, and I guess we are done, or is there something you want to say about your topic? Or just, you can also communicate via your records that you have uh, thank you, Hedon Pakai, for the interview. Ja me tosiaan jatketaan DJ-musalla. Jos tulee kylmä, tai jos täällä on jo liian kylmä, niin me siirrytään tuonne alakertaan, mutta alakerran klubitilassa jatkuu ilta sitten aina yli puolen yön. Oh, joo, on mahdollisuus kysyä myös. Yeah, exactly. uh, could I please ask one question? Hedon. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have two questions to my mate, real quick. Uh, First, real quick one. Uh, you said you have stopped doing field work right now, so what the kind of a the kind of feel experience of this ethnographic scene is uh, winding to its end in a sense. Or is that why? Could I please ask you to illuminate a little bit what's the outcome, what are your theoretical, theoretical kind of uh, notions that you're going to bring about in the logic of how you're going to pull this together? What's so, the what's the vitus in your vitus? So, uh, on, uh, on, 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 so for, there are like few aspects that I, I bring in, you know. One is I uh, through problematizing of the. Do I use this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, through problematizing of the of the concept of cultural production, I I, I showed that you know uh, cultural producers are uh, are uh, in effect rather than gatekeepers, as as this guy, um, as some of the literature would suggest, you know. So I kind of dethrone these guys a little bit. Um, the other, the other aspect is the, the process aspect of understanding, and I think this is something that is lacking in, in cultural production literature. These nitty gritty details of the processes of how this, this, this stuff, stuff happens in general. And moreover, I think uh, we can understand somehow better the dynamics between what the, the cultural, uh, cultural production literature likes to call the, 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 the interplay between consumption and production. My second question, if I may, I'd like to ask you both. Um, so when I was doing my four-year ethnography on the rise and fall of dubstep culture, if you will, in London, New York, and Helsinki, uh, the key question for me theoretically emerges cultural accelerations, which is not a new idea. Mm. Technological, social, cultural acceleration of this. So you had the drama based scene, if you will, and that was like maybe, what, 15 years? And then you know the dubstep scene. In my case, that lasted for arguably seven to eight years as it's kind of a kind of a rallying point to people talk about it. Uh, and dubstep, of course, was the first, uh, arguably the first uh, scene, electronic music scene that was born and bred through the uh, kind of parallel development of the internet connectivity, rather than drum and bass that kind of 
started up well before and then kind of fell into it. My question is, uh, so we haven't talked much about the critical, so how do you see, to my, all the people I was hanging out with, interviewing, chilling out, writing, uh, writing papers about, it was about this kind of losing control, losing the grip, was the general mood of the whole culture thing. And, uh, Okay, that's, I guess, enough explanation. My question is, how do you see this? Because I think that's a rather pertinent topic when you talk about, you know, late capitalism or yes. whatever, yes. all these kind of things. Well, I, it's, it's, I've been trying to think about how, for example, this particular scene it differs from other music-related scenes, like, like dubstep. I'm not sure that actually, you know, these guys are, are losing the grip, per se. I see more and more these people getting better in cultural entrepreneurship, for example, and uh, is that then again just vanilla capitalism? That they're kind of doing that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 they, they cannot escape capitalism. It's just the way they do capitalism is is very interesting. So, uh, for example, uh, before some of these guys were kind of more in this losing the grip because, okay, I have a degree in, in, uh, in media, but I really want to do DJing and I want to be part of this culture. But now, all of a sudden, they are part of this system. So now everything is much more calm and being in control of, its, of his or her own future, in a sense. But maybe it's also, it could be that this, this culture is somehow territorialized, if you will, in a particular way. So maybe in a year or so, things can collapse. So, for does, now... Does the interviewer have any thoughts on this? Not really, but uh, but it is interesting that uh, you say that anything can happen, it can collapse, and, and also reminds me of of what uh, Little Tony has once said in one of his interviews that like it it also is the same case with venues, like anything can happen. So I think he said that that it's dangerous to fall in love with a venue because. Well, they had experiences that they have had plans with certain venues and then the owner owner has said that no you you have to leave our applause and then it goes like that this is very very interesting for example because it's been 10 years now that since i've been living in in, in finland and if you see especially because i don't remember the places the, these guys used to run before but for example i remember during the nola times you know there was this the scene was somehow a little bit scattered you know it was not as how would I say, as, as rigid or as sophisticated as it is now. But it's only after these guys have joined forces in a sense that have, they have managed to kind of create something or forge something that is as stable as it is now. But uh, we have to understand that also the, 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 the discourse on this particular scene, like globally speaking, is very uh, dominant now. And it may well be that something can happen. It's always, it, that, that's always a pos possibility. And we know that Tony tried al already uh, a few years ago when Nola Bar was still open next door, a KY building. It didn't work. So there are these, in these ingredients have to be in place in order to have something as stable as this scene is. Any more comments? I'm happy that there have been also comments from the audience because I think that's quite academic or part of the scene. Uh, if not, then we'll start playing records and, and thank you all so much for your that you have been here and, and please stay, the bar is open. <laughs>